So today, uh, I want to welcome uh, all of you. If you are new to I've Just Seattle, I just want to extend uh, my welcome to all of you to this church. And I hope that uh, you know you will feel that this church will be part of your community and your uh, faith journey as you are here in Seattle. Amen. So today, I want to share, continue with the sermon series called Simplicity Works. Uh, you know, is having to pursue a life that is meaningful, but yet at the same time that is important for all of us, right? Uh, how many of you have ever heard the term uh, human being, not human doing? None of you have heard that term? Okay, yeah, I, I kind of guess because I don't even know who wrote it actually. Uh, but it's kind of fascinating, so that's why I titled today's sermon human being, not human doing. Amen? Uh, I, want, I have a five fascinating facts about human body that I, I did not even know before this, you know. Uh, and so maybe this will be a good one uh, to those of you who are taking maybe biology. You can impress your, your professor by saying these uh, five fascinating facts. The first fact is uh, your mouth produces about one liter of saliva each day. Isn't that amazing? Why would we need to drink if you produce one liter of water anyway? Uh, number two is that late end to end, an adult blood vessels could circle the earth equator four times. That's inside your body. Is it real? I, I don't know. It's just so fascinating to me. Uh, number three, you had more bones at birth versus as an adult. You have 300 bones when you are at birth and 206 as an adult. No, 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 that's not the Seattle area code. That's the number of bones that you have, okay? Number four, spread across their lifetime. Most people spend an average of one whole year sitting in the toilet. <laughs> wow, very productive. <laughs> number five, your jaw is actually the strongest muscle in your body. I did not know that. Yeah, I, I guess so because I practice a lot, you know with my jaw by, you know, chewing and eating. Uh, and then this, uh, I, this is not fascinating fact, I, but I felt so wrong, uh, but I, I want to share it with you because it's so funny. Uh, that's why uh, I'll share it with, for, with you first. It says, humans share about 50% DNA with a banana. No wonder you guys go bananas, right? That's not true, that's not true, okay? Um, I don't know who wrote it, but that's not true. It's just funny facts, okay? Uh, so, I, like I said today, um, you know, we're talking about we are human beings more than human doings, okay? Human doings, uh, this is from psychology today, it, it quoted like this, human doings believe that they must do things, parenthesis, really well, to be valued in our society. Is that true? That's quite true, right? A lot of us are taught from young that your doing, your achievement, what you can accomplish is what makes you valuable in this society uh, and to value themselves. Human beings believe that their self-worth is defined by their values, attitudes, and belief. So to shift from being a human doing to a human being, you must first change the way you view human beings. Because you are created to be a human being with a purpose in God. Okay? Christianity is far more than holding the right beliefs or adop adopting right behaviors or doing stuff for God. It is about communion with Christ. That's why we sang that song that Jesus is the center of my life. You know, our life should surround Jesus. Jesus is not our priority. Sometimes people ask, like, Pastor, what is your priority? I said, number one is my family. He said, what? Number one is not God. He said, oh, no, 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 no. God is not my priority. Because if God is your priority, God can be your number one priority this week. He can be your number two priority next week. But God should be the center of your life, not a priority. Okay? So God should be the center of your life, not a priority in your life. You understand what I'm trying to say? So whether you are working, whether you are in your family, whether in your personal life, whether in health or in anything, God should not be a priority. It should be a part of every priorities of your life. 
then that way you will not fluctuate between God being your number one priority today and God being your last priority the next day. Because God will always be the center of every part of your life. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Acts 17, 28, he says, For in Christ, for in Him, we live and move and have our being. So first and foremost, for all of us Christians, before you even do stuff for Jesus, before you are in ministry, I think you need to learn how to have your being in communion with Him. I think it's very important to have that mindset, right? You know, we are trained from when we were young that achievements, completing tasks as are commendable, especially like me from Singapore. You know, accomplishment is everything. Getting a B is a no option. There is no B in our vocabulary. It's all about A. Like I told you last week, A plus, right? I didn't even know that there is a plus in front of a in front of your A until recently. Like, oh, there is a plus in front of your A. Wonderful, you know. But we, from young, we are trained that our achievement, what we can do, is accomplishment, are commendable. That's, that's how you are valued. How you are valued in society is based on your achievement, right? How many degrees that you have. You know, in Indonesia, it's very funny because in Indonesia, if you see people's name, you know, before and after the name, they always have the degrees. They always put it, you know, either in the email signature, they always say professor, doctor, engineer, Air One, Ngadi Sastra, MBA, MTH, MDF, PhD. They, all, they put every of their accomplishment in their signature. Why? Because that's how you are valued, right? How many of you understand what I'm talking about, right? So, Here's what um, a professor from PBC, I actually attended his class. Uh, oh, before that, let, let me read this. He said, we are trained from young that the achievement and completing tasks are commendable, but very few are imparted the importance of relationship and abiding. The values of abiding in Christ are first and foremost important even before we begin our ministry and being fruitful. So for all of you, I, I plead to you, you know, let's have communion with Christ first. Let's have your being with Christ first before you start doing and be fruitful in Christ. Uh, Dr. Lenny Hubbard, professor at PBC, it says this, the fear of so many people today is that their lives will be lost in the pool of humanity without any personal significance. It's very sad, isn't it? So what is abiding in Christ? J.C. Ryle uh, explains like this, to abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant close communion with, with Christ. To be always leaning on Him, resting on Him, pouring out our hearts to Him, and using Him as our fountain of life and strength. As our chief companion and best friend. To have His words abide, abiding in us is to keep His sayings, precepts continually before our memories and minds and to make them the guide of our action and the rule of our daily conduct and behavior. That is how we abide in Christ, is that to allow that relationship with Him in every part of our lives, not only the church part of your life, not only your ministry life that you abide in Christ, but in every aspect of your life, including your job, your work, your studies, your personal life, your family, your relationship, everything must come from that abiding in Christ. So I have three things I want to share with you, the importance in abiding in God. If you have your Bible, open up with me in John chapter 15. And we're going to unpack these few verses from John chapter 15, verse 4 to 8. And I'm going to use a, a, an unusual version that I don't use a lot. It's the New King James Version, to those of you following. So there are three things I want to share with you from John 15, verse 4 to 8. Number one is fruitfulness. We are all called to be a fruitful being. Okay. Listen to this, okay? In John 15 verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruits of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus is the vine. Do you guys know what's a vine? A vine is almost like a grape's 
fruit plant, you know, a grape plant. I used to have a grape vines in my house. You know, it, at first it looks beautiful, uh, especially the first harvest. You know, I was so excited during the first harvest. I got all these uh, little grapes that tasted almost like a, a sweet wine, you know. Uh, it's, it's wonderful, but the only problem is that it grows so much that I can hardly uh, harvest it. You know, it's so fruitful that I can catch up with it, you know. Even before I uh, uh, harvest it, it fell on the ground. <laughs> and then at the end of summer, there's so much fruit flies in my backyard, you know. Uh, at first, I was excited. So the vine is a grape vine, okay? I, how many of you have seen a grape vine? A grape vine, it's spread. You know, it's spread all over the place. So it, you need to prune it and cut it. But his, Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. You are the branches. He is the vine. He is the main uh, source of that plant, right? He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The funny thing about the branches is it has no function. <laughs> and it doesn't do much. <laughs> All it does is that it just stick and abiding in the vine, which is the main source. And somehow, it automatically grow fruits. That's the function of the branch. And the funny thing about a vine branch, it cannot be used to build anything <laughs> because it's quite soft. Okay, it cannot be used, you know, you cannot cut it down to build buildings. You cannot cut it down to build, you know, shack or anything. It, its function is to just stuck with the vine, to abide with the vine and grow fruits. That's it. That's its only function. Okay? So, here's what uh, uh, one writer uh, spoke so eloquently. In God Calling, in God Calling, Sarah Young writes as if Jesus is speaking the following words. He says, trust me enough to spend ample time with me, pushing back the demands of the day, refuse to feel guilty about something that is so pleasing to me, the king of the universe. Sometimes we get to do, 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 accomplish, accomplish, busy, 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 that we sometimes don't have the focus and the heart to really actually abide in God, in His presence, to rest in Him, to read the Word, to spend time in prayer. These are some vital, important uh, uh, characteristics of Christians that wants to be fruitful, okay? And what does fruits mean? You know, fruits can mean a lot of stuff. Fruits can mean the fruit of the Spirit, like in Galatians chapter 5, right? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Uh, gentleness, self-control, that can be the fruits when you abide in Christ. But fruit can also mean your legacy, how you left your footprints in, the pe in people's life. I always pray that no matter who I encounter, wherever I go, I want to leave a legacy for the people that I, I encounter. And I hope you have the same mindset too, that wherever you go, you want to leave a footprint of legacy, a good footprint of legacy into that people, right? Uh, fruits can also be referencing to leading people to Christ. That can also be fruitful, right? Like, you know, the people is our mission. We want to see people uh, be reached out and to get to know God, to be connected with God, and to grow in God. That can be fruitfulness too. Fruitfulness is a life that is full of purpose, joy and multiplication yes this includes blessing okay don't be scared when the pastor said blessing because when the pastor said blessing everybody oh pastor speak blessing it's like it's okay because that's what god wants you to be is to be fruitful to have multiplication to have a life of purpose yes it includes blessing can you say amen how many of you want to be blessed <laughs> all the christians shy you're know, like oh, blessing is so unholy Include blessing and say amen. I want that blessing, right? Hey, I'm a pastor. I'm not ashamed of getting God's blessing. Why should you, right? Blessing does not mean unholy. Come on, man. You got the wrong theology. As a human, my being in the Lord's presence is the best preparation for my doing in Him. My doing will have more depth, more power when I'm aware of being in His presence. So, my brothers and sisters, we can be busy doing God's thing, but the question is, do you know whether you are in His presence doing those things? Otherwise, you will be burned out. 
You know, the funny thing is like this word burn out is used most in church than in anywhere else. Why? Because they just don't have a clue what they are doing. They are just merely doing, 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 but they don't see the big picture. You know, one day, a, a guy came to a Toyota factory. Yeah. He asked these three workers, he said, how many years have you worked in this factory? So, oh, I've been working here for 10 years. Oh, wonderful. So what did you do? I pressed this button. Oh, okay. That's great. Faithful. 15 years pressing this button. And then he asked the second person, how many years you've been working in this factory? I've been working for seven years. Wow, that's great. What did you do? Oh, I just uh, uh, solder these two metal together. I said, oh, wow, seven years, seven years. Very faithful. And then this other guy, he said, how many years have you been working here? I've been working here for two years. He said, wonderful. So what are you making? And then he looked at the guy and said, I'm making a Toyota. Somebody who see the big picture, who know the big picture, will have a greater excitement than those that just know how to press button. You understand? I think that's a concept for a lot of you working people too. Right? If you just go to the office or to the factory merely just pressing button, sooner or later you will be burned out. Okay, but if you know the big picture, I think you'll be more excited. The same way with ministry too. If you know that Jesus is the center of it all, that in Him and through Him and for Him that we serve and we do, then you will never say the word burn out. Okay? So my doing will have more depth, will have more power, when I'm aware of being in His presence, I realize that I'm not just human doing, uh, a human doing my own thing to impress the Lord. I'm a human being transformed into His likeness by being in His presence, which prepares me for doing the works that He has planned for me to do. So I want to ask you, Christian, do you know that God loves you? Seriously, personally, do you know that God loves you? Or it is just a mere statement. It's like, oh, God loves you. God bless you. You know? Sometimes in America, a lot of times people talk to you or ask you questions. They don't even care. Really, they don't even care. You know, when I first came to America, before I became a Christian, okay, please don't judge me, okay? This is just me being a stupid young, you know, man, a very crazy. You guys know, some, some of you know my story, right? I came from a very crazy background, so please don't judge me. So when I first came to America, I wasn't really a strong Christian yet. I just get to know Christ uh, by then. I, you guys know, right? I came to church just because I was looking for girls and, you know, bad motivation. But anyway, uh, so I came to America. I realized that when people say, how are you? They don't care about how are you. You know, I was so mad. Sometimes, hey, how are you? Irwan? Before I even answer, they already walk away. <laughs> what? What's the deal? Why do you ask that question if you don't even want to know my answer? So one day, uh, again, please don't judge me. I was at the bar, okay? I was sitting at the bar. The bar was so noisy. And the bartender was asking me, how are you? And me being mischievous and crazy, so I, I did something crazy. So I answered him. So he said, hey, how are you, man? He was wiping the counter. And I said, I slept with your wife, bro. <laughs> and you know what he answered to me? Oh, good for you, man. Good for you. He doesn't care about what my, my answer is. <laughs> okay, please don't judge me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of judgmental eyes. I'm just telling you, my, during my crazy, crazy, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> but if you know that God really loves you, if you truly understand what God is trying to say to you, and you care, and you listen, and you discern what God is trying to say to you, then your doing will have much more meaningful and that's, where, that's how you get fruitfulness. You will be very fruitful. You know, the same way like this. If you, one day, a, a, a young man, you know, after a busy week of work, he was being called by this girl. You know, he has a feeling for this girl, but it was a new feeling, you know. And the girl called, he said, hey, you know, John, can you come over to my apartment? I need you to uh, move some furniture to my friend's apartment. And, you know, because he has feelings, he felt like he's obligated to do it. But he wasn't sure because the girl hasn't really responded her feelings. So it's, it's a one-way 
guys, you guys understand what I'm talking about, right? You had feelings with this girl, but the girl hasn't responded yet. So you were like, I want to impress her. I'm obligated to impress her, but I'm not sure if she responded the same way. You know, so to cut the long story, she, she, he made it, you know, because he felt obligated. He didn't want to insult the girl. So he came to the apartment. So he was so tired. He was like so you know, exhausted. He was carrying this sofa. And then as he was carrying this sofa, uh, the girl touched the arm and he said, hey, you know what, John? I really care for you. I love you too. Suddenly, John, come on, John. What do you guys think? Is he tired? No. Suddenly, he told his friend, I can handle it myself. <laughs> Why? Because he was doing it out of knowing that he was loved. If you know that God loves you and has already died for you, the way you serve Him, the way you do for Him will be different. He's like, come on, I can do it myself. I don't need you. And then you can carry that so far by yourself. No, you know, I used, again, don't judge me, okay? I used to be... Uh, you know, I had a long-distance relationship. How many of you have a long-distance relationship? Oh, yeah, very painful. I, I understand that. You know, I, I had a long-distance relationship. So I used to live in Eugene, Oregon, and my girlfriend lives in Seattle. Okay? So almost every other weekend, I have to drive from Eugene to Seattle. That's about, uh, I think it's about five and a half hours to six hours drive, you know, every other weekend. You know, my friend's like, oh, man, you, you're not tired, you know? I said, no, dude. I'm driving to see the love of my life. Why would I feel tired? The same way, okay? If you have love, if you know that God is loving you, the way you respond, the way you do things, is very different. It's going to be very different, believe me. So I want you to know this first before you even begin doing. Being first. Being and abiding in God first, right? So I drove, man. I love it, you know, turning my music, five and a half hours feels like only 15 minutes, you know, driving. You know, and, uh, Brother Ching Ming used to say too, you know, he crossed from Seattle to Bellevue. <laughs> he loved it too. Yeah, right? You don't feel it, you know. Of course, Seattle to Bellevue. It's different from Eugene to, to, <laughs> to Seattle. Okay. It says this, if you know how much God loves you and you understand that, your doing will not be out of obligation, but it will be out of love. The same way with that boy, right? He will feel like, yeah, energized, man, right? You guys, boys, are you guys trying to feel like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about, you know? Number two, number one is fruitfulness. Number two is faithfulness. John 15 verse 6, it says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gathered them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You know, some studies say that if you don't abide in Christ, these are talking about believers, okay? These are talking about believers. Some people say that if you don't abide in Christ, you're going to be thrown to hell. I want you to know that that's not the context here. Don't get it wrong, okay? I want you to take a look at this. If you look at the verse, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out. But suddenly, the pronouns is changed to them. You see that? From he, a singular person, suddenly it changed into a plural pronouns, right? Them, they. This is not talking about Christians, believers who does not abide in Christ, who does, who does not remain faithful to be thrown into hell. That's not my gospel. <laughs> okay? That's not my gospel. What it says here is that Whatever that they do, their works will be thrown because it has no worth if you, if you continue to work and you don't abide in Christ. That's what it means. So your faithfulness does not guarantee your salvation, but your faithfulness guarantees your fruitfulness. So don't get it wrong, okay? So Jesus was speaking to the, to the believers. There is no such context where he was referring to the unbelievers here or even believers who rejected Christ. This is not the context. The context here is that doing that works outside the fellowship of Christ. This is talking about people who are prideful, who said, I don't need to abide in Christ. I will do my ministry and have no relationship with, 
you know, abiding in Christ, not in His presence, not in His knowledge. I'm just doing whatever I can do. Those works will be thrown because it has no worth. Okay, so the works is being cast out. The works are going to be burned, not the person. Okay, don't get it wrong. Okay, John chapter 10, why do I know this? Because there are two evidence in the Bible that will support what I just said. Okay, number one is Romans 8, 38 to 39. It says nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, not even you. He said can separate God's love from, from us. Number two is that John chapter 10, John chapter 10, verse 28, it says this, I give them eternal life. Who gave eternal life? It's God. Okay, Jesus gave you eternal life. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. You don't find it. God gave it to you. Come on. It's a gift for you. He says, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. But your faithfulness will bring you your fruitfulness. Come on, everybody. Are you guys still with me? Here's what one commentary said. You know, one commentary said this. The fire in this verse is not hell. But the burning of works done while a believer is out of fellowship with the Lord. Jesus will burn these works at the Bema seats, the final judgment for Christian. It is the believer's works, not the person that is being burned. The believer will have eternal life, but his works will be burned because they are worthless. This person will have no or little reward. And that was taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 15. You see, the branches of the vine have no other worth or function because it's so, uh, so floppy, you know, it's very thin. Not, not that strong. So it cannot be used to build building. It cannot be used to build anything. All its function is to just abide with the vine and bear fruits. That's it. And bear what fruits? The grapefruits. That's it. That's all the function. If it doesn't work that function, there is no more work. There is no more job for, for this person. That's it. Your job as a Christian is to be fruitful in Christ. What does it mean to be fruitful? Like I said, to lead people to Christ to have a good legacy that you leave behind for other people, right? And then the fruit of the Spirit. Number three is that when you abide in Christ, there is not only fruitfulness, but also there is favors. Favors. There is, you guys know what's favors, right? It's blessing. <gasps> you know, there is blessing for you. In John chapter 15, we're still in John chapter 15, verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. But, my, but by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. There is favor and blessing when you continue to abide in Him. Whatever you ask, God will give it to you. So now the question is like, but God, but Pastor, but what if I ask? You guys remember last week, right? What, but what if I ask, I want a BMW. <laughs> but God did not give me a BMW. I said, oh, wait a minute. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, which means that if you abide in him and the words abide, the way you pray is different from when you are not abiding. You understand? The way you pray is aligned with God's will. You are not praying about a BMW. I, I guarantee you, if you abide in Him, you are praying for something more meaningful, right? Like I prayed for a BMW. What did I get? A beat up Volkswagen. Okay, my dad says, why do you need a BMW? Your boss doesn't even drive a BMW. Drive something cheap. And he bought me a Volkswagen. And what he forgot to buy for me is the jumping cable. Because every time I want to start that Volkswagen, I need to jump it first. That's how bad that Volkswagen is. It's just such a beat up car. Why? Because he said, if you drive a BMW, you won't get it. My dad is so old fashioned. If you drive a BMW and your interviewer see your BMW, you don't need a job because you have a lot of money already. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I don't think that, he said, no, believe me, get a BMW, uh, get a Volkswagen, a beat up Volkswagen. Because when your boss sees you driving this beat up car, he will hire you because you're so poor, you need money. 
It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Thanks. That's why I'm very expert in jumping car. Every day I jump my car. You know, every day before I left my work, I need to make sure that I'm not the last person to leave work. Because otherwise nobody will jump my car. <laughs> okay? It's crazy. But anyway, go back to this, okay? Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire, it shall be done for you. These favors, when we abide in Christ, we are connected to the source, to the vine that flows into those branches. The nutrition that you need, everything that you need in your life to be fruitful will be supplied for you. You don't even have to worry about it. When you abide in Him, everything that you need will flow from that vine. You remember my, my vine tree? I never see my branches do anything. It just stay there. It just stuck. But every year after year, it will continue to grow. It will continue to bear fruits. Doing nothing. Just abiding with the vine. It will bear fruits. Every year, it's faithfully bearing fruits. I had so much fruits that finally, I cut the whole vine trees. Because there's so much fruit flies in my house. Abide. You know, as opposite as it sounds, is true. For you, if you want to be fruitful, you want to be blessed, you want your, your needs to be supplied, God is your provider, abide in Him, in His presence, okay? But actually, Pastor JP, you guys know Pastor JP, right? He preached here several times. He actually wrote this in, in his Facebook. How many of you, sometimes Facebook is useful too, you know? So I read it to you, okay? He wrote this, which is kind of quite interesting. He says, as opposite as it sounds, the anxious heart can often appear on the outside, similar to the prayerful heart. Intensity, passion, drive, focus, determination, it almost looks the same. However, the anxious heart cannot abide because its fuel is in the doing. The abiding heart knows how to access being. It knows when to run, when to rest, when to give, when to receive. How? Because it's not living from the place of achievement, but from the secure, intimate obedience. One will simply produce the next thing in our lives, while the other produces the peaceable fruits of life itself. How many of you want peace? How many of you want to be fruitful? How many of you want to be blessed? Anxiousness brings exhaustion with few answers to prayer. Abiding from prayer brings refreshing and strength from the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? So good. So good. You can take photo, okay? And, and, and give Pastor JP the credit. In closing, in closing, continue. Chapter 15, uh, John 15. Okay, I'm going to close with this. John 15, verse 11. He says, these things I've spoken to you. Over the past 20 minutes, I've spoken to you. That my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Joy means finding a reason for great gladness. It is a reason to live. Joy is a reason to live. Because in His presence, there is fullness of joy. How many of you have lost your joy? How many of you have anxiousness? How many of you, no matter what you try, you will never be happy? Joy is more than an emotion and a feeling. It is a state of rest. It is a position of being. It is not conditional in our circumstances, in our, con in our situation, in our environment. Because His joy always remains in you when you abide in Christ. So today, I want to answer one more question before we end. Maybe some of you ask, that, how do we abide then? <laughs> right? I mean, abide is such a big word. How do we abide? You know, I don't even know God's address. How do I stuck with Him, right? I think there's two words that will make you able to start abiding in Him. Okay, make it easy. Okay, just these two words. Number one is trust. Number two is obedience in the character of Christ through His words. What does it mean? If you want to, be, if you want to abide in Christ, you need to know the character of Christ. True? If you want to know somebody, you need to know the character of that person, right? In order to know the character of that person, either you need to spend time with that person or you need to read the Word, right? Read the Bible because the Bible tells us about the character of God. You know, 
I'm going to end with this illustration and it's going to date me. I'm going to regret it, but it's okay. As long as I get the point across. Okay? So when I was dating at that time, you know, <clears throat> so in order for me to communicate with my, girl, my ex-girlfriend at that time, this is not Kelsey, this is ex-girlfriend, okay, <laughs> is to write letters. <gasps> okay, you write letters, you know, sometimes I write two pages, three pages, I, I write letters and then I will mail it. It's very fun. If you guys want to try it, you should try it. You know, email not fun. You know, write letters, and then you know, you lick the the the, the envelope. You put the uh, the stamp, and then you send it, and then she will receive it in about a week. And you have to wait for one more week to receive the response. But when you receive the response, oh boy, oh boy, you know, you're like jumping. <gasps> you open it. I read it. You know, the first time I read it, sometimes I misunderstood. You know, sometimes when you write email or you write a text, sometimes you don't know the tone. She wrote it like, oh, she's angry? Why is she angry with me? Then you have to read it again. So, oh, it's not, she's not angry. You know, and then you read it, you read it. The more you read, the more you understand what she's trying to tell you. You know, and reading that makes me goosebumps, you know. Yeah. So, if you want to know God and His character, I think it's easy to start with reading first. I know a lot of Asian uh, students doesn't like to read. Okay, if you don't like to read, uh, maybe let the Bible read it for you. There is an app now. You just turn it on and then the, the Bible will read it to you. You don't even have to read. You can just close your eyes and then the Bible will. Anyway, to, to <laughs> cut the joke, uh, read the Bible. It's easy because the Bible now is cheap. Okay, when I was younger, in order to buy a Bible, it cost like $60 to buy a Bible. And then if you want to engrave your name, $15 additional. $75 to buy a Bible. Today, you can have your Bible in your palm for only free. All the Asians say, hallelujah. I can tell it. Free? <laughs> yes, it's free. The Bible is free. You can, open, you can open your Apple Store or your Samsung whatever. Uh, it's called U-Version. U-Version. Okay, download the U-Version. If you want to read from the Gospel, John chapter 1, so be it. If you don't know, you can start with a reading plan. There is a, read, a lot of reading plan in U-Version. I want you to start. You know, I don't want you to be like so overachiever, like, oh yes, I must start reading the Bible one hour every day. Good for you. I'm just asking you, start about three minutes a day. Very easy. You can just sit in the toilet and read it if you want. Three minutes a day. You know, if you don't know what to read, like, but where do I read? Just one advice, don't start from Numbers and Deuteronomy. Okay, just read other things. Just don't start from Numbers or Deuteronomy. Okay, or make it even simpler. You can, again, in your version, you can say, okay, I want to follow a reading plan about anxiety. And then you will have like a seven-day plan, 10-day plan that share with you about how to overcome anxiety. You can start there. Easy, right? It's three minutes reading, right? Can you do it? I think it's good to start from there first. Very easy. You want to abide in God? is to know his character through his word. And how do you know? Yeah, just follow the U version. It's free. And once in a while, you get a treat. You get to see 